Okay, so I'm going to make a start now. So this is the last of my webinars today, and the subject is the human digestive system. So in this session with you this morning, I'm going to do a number of different things. So first of all, we're going to get to grips with some of the definitions associated with nutrition and metabolism. Then we're going to have a look at the components of the human diet and their roles in metabolism. And then the large part of the lecture will be on the digestive processes in humans. So what we will do there is we'll look at the structure, the function and control of the human digestive system. But first of all, let's have a look at some definitions. First of all, the definition of the word metabolism. The word metabolism literally means all of the chemical reactions that are going on in your body at any one time. Some people think metabolism is sort of a separate thing to do with nutrition, but it isn't. It's a definition that encompasses all the reactions going on in your body at one time. Now, I've probably mentioned before that there are probably 10 to 15,000 chemical reactions going on in, in your cells at any one time. Now, if you multiply that by the sheer size of the body, that's millions of chemical reactions. Now, all of those reactions are termed metabolism. And we can split metabolism into two parts. And this diagram up at the top here shows you how we can split that into two components. And simply, we can split it into two types of chemical reaction. One of these is those reactions that make things in the body. And we call those anabolic reactions, and all of those are termed anabolism. We might want to remember this if you know anything at all about anabolic steroids, which are used um, illegally in bodybuilding and athletics. They're taken to build up muscle. Now, the other side of the coin of metabolism is those reactions that break down things, and that is called catabolism, and therefore these are called catabolic reactions. Now, what we need to see is that chemical energy is the key to these reactions. These reactions do not occur without chemical energy. Catabolism breaking down to release energy and anabolism using energy to build things up. So those many thousands and thousands of chemical reactions require energy. And the energy is used in those reactions to replace and generate molecules that make up our bodies and allow it to function. Now we need energy so much that we have a special system, which we're going to see later, the digestive system, to help produce the raw materials. The raw materials are there because energy production is reliant on the breakdown of food, that is catabolic reactions, alongside a steady supply of energy donating molecules such as oxygen. Oxygen is vital to the production of energy in the body. Without it, our body cannot make energy. So this brings us on in a roundabout way to why we need to eat. And the reason we need to eat and the reason why we need to discuss nutrition is because food, the food that we eat, is broken down to release molecular energy and raw materials. So the molecular energy is there to allow building reactions to take place, okay, and to drive breakdown um, reactions. And the raw materials are there, just like the building blocks on a building site. Can't build anything without those raw materials. So we take in, in our diet, all the different raw materials to make up a living organism. So all of our body, all of our homeostatic processes, 
all aspects of cell structure and function, and therefore all the structure and function of the body, depend on an adequate diet. And that diet is providing us with those raw materials and energy for um, life. Now the other reason why we need adequate nutrition is to maintain that overwhelming proportion of the body that is fluid. Body fluids, um, mainly water, but in those water dissolved a whole range of different substances like salts, mineral salts, ions, the electrolytes, these are very important. So nutrition provides us with that water and those electrolytes. So let's move on now and have a look at the dietary components. So what is it that we eat? Or what is it that is com comprises our diet? We can split it into three areas, really. First of all, we can think of a macronutrient um, component to our diet. Secondly, a micronutrient component to our diet. And thirdly, and quite importantly, water. What we're going to do is we're going to have a look at these components now in turn. So we're going to start with the macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, fiber, and the nucleic acids. And then we'll move on to look at the micronutrients, the minerals, and the vitamins. So let's make a start. And the first group of substances important in our diet are the carbohydrates. Now carbohydrates are important molecules on Earth, full stop. They're very, very widespread um, in, in nature. And in fact, here's a fact that 80% of the world's carbon is found in one molecule, and that's cellulose. In plants and cellulose containing organisms. Most of the carbohydrates we encounter in nature are what we call complex polysaccharides. And it might be worth us having a look at that word polysaccharide. Poly meaning many, saccharide meaning sugar. And if we look at this diagram up here, you can see the simple carbohydrates, which are simple molecules, simple sugar molecules like glucose here. So this is a very simple um, sugar. And you add another one to it to get sucrose, but still quite simple. But the vast majority of carbohydrates are complex carbohydrates with a number of different repeating sugar units. The most important thing to say about carbohydrates in terms of our diet is that they're important energy stores. Carbohydrates are used by living organisms to store energy. So for instance, in plants, it is starch, which is the major complex carbohydrate. Whereas in animals, like ourselves, it is a substance called glycogen. Now the names are different, but the structures aren't. The structures are still this chain of repeating sugar units. And the theory is that when you break down these individual units, you release energy. And that energy is used to drive um, the cell. Also, these simple sugars can be used to add on to important molecules to make them work correctly in the body. So a lot of proteins have sugars attached to them to allow them to work properly in the body. Carbohydrates are important and we need a steady supply of them to provide energy. If we don't have a steady supply of carbohydrates, then effectively we first of all use our energy stores. So we mobilize our glucose, which is the primary energy source in the body, from glycogen. And then when we run out of glycogen, or when glycogen is running low, we then convert fats and protein to get the energy that we need. So carbohydrates are important energy sources.
Now on to proteins. Now proteins are some of the most important molecules in the human body. They are probably one of the most important macromolecules in living systems. And the reason is, is that proteins are both structural and functional. That is, they are major components of the structures of the body, but they also carry out the work of the body in the form of enzymes. Enzymes driving all those thousands and thousands of chemical reactions um, that we spoke about earlier. Now, proteins are made up of amino acids. They're made up of amino acids joined together. So amino acids joined together um, rather like we saw um, in the previous slide. This macromolecule protein is made of repeating units called amino acids. So carbohydrates were repeating units of simple sugars. Proteins are repeating units of amino acids. And the other thing that we need um, from our proteins is nitrogen. Nitrogen is needed in the making of amino acids and in complex proteins. Now, one of the things that we should understand about proteins is that they can be made in our livers. So our liver can make and our cells can make a wide range of different proteins. And they need amino acids. Those amino acids can come from the liver. The liver is very, very good at recycling amino acids into new proteins. However, some cannot be manufactured in the body, and we term those the essential amino acids. So the term essential amino acids means an amino acid that is unable to be manufactured in the body and has to be eaten in our diet. Another term for protein is complete. Now complete is a term to use whenever a protein has all the required essential amino acids. So if we eat animal protein, because it is uh, largely mammals that we eat, um, although we eat some fish as well, because it is from animals, it does contain all exactly the same essential amino acids that we need. However, if one's a vegetarian, one will need to mix your vegetable sources to gain all those different amino acids. Vegetable sources are not necessarily complete. That is, they don't contain all the necessary amino acids. And I think we know um, where we get a lot of our proteins from. So from animal sources, it's meat, fish, and dairy. So from vegetable so sources, some seeds, nuts, beans, cereals, etc. So those are proteins. Very, very important. Another vitally important and probably misunderstood macronutrient are the fats, or what we call lipids. Lipids are incredibly important in the body. They are in a very, very valuable energy store, and animals have evolved to store lipids for that purpose, to be able to build reserves of energy um, for, for lean periods. The other thing about lipids is that they're incredibly important building blocks for large numbers of the important molecules in the body. So they're essential, first of all, for building cell membranes. Cell membranes don't work without lipids. They're also, and we saw this in the endocrine system lecture, vital for the production of hormones. So something like cholesterol, very important for making all the steroid hormones. And the other thing that you might not know about fats is that they're very important for carrying things around the body. Transport. So moving things around the body often requires carriers based on lipids. Now we eat lipids typically in the form known as a triglyceride. The tri portion of this signifies that it's made up of three units of fatty acids. And the glyceride portion is that it contains glycerol. So this is the typical dietary lipid. So this is the typical um, absorbed fat 
from our diet. Now, another lipid that we're all aware of is cholesterol. Cholesterol is incredibly important and it is actually manufactured in the body. So one of the things that we need to consider in our diets is whether or not we need to eat a lot of cholesterol because we can actually make it already. It's made in the liver and it's used in all of our cell membranes and in the production of steroid hormones, as I said earlier. Now, there's a wide range of variations in our dietary lipids because there are actually 40 naturally occurring fatty acids. So in our diet, we can have up to 40 different combinations of fatty acids in our food. Lipids are interesting because there's a lot of controversy and a lot of discussion about their importance and their role in health. What we do know, however, is that of all the lipids, there are three essential fatty acids. Again, um, these are needed because we don't either produce them or they're not produced in enough quantity to satisfy our demands. Now, the most important of these three, which are linoleic, linolenic, and arachidonic acid, is linoleic acid. This is the one that we do have an absolute requirement for because the others can actually be made in the body. Now, we find linoleic acid in a range of sources. We find it in oils, such as the sunflower oil and corn oil, but we also find it in nuts and cereals and in wheat germ. So linoleic acid, an important essential fatty acid. Now, where do we find lipids? Well, I'm sure we know that we can find fats in both animals and vegetable sources. Now, terminology that we refer to when we look at lipids is this terminology of saturated or unsaturated fats. There are a number of other terms to do with fat such as hydrogenated or trans fats, but we're not interested in that at this moment in time. Now, animal lipid is generally available in one or two forms, the saturated form or the unsaturated form. Now, it sounds strange um, why we want to define these chemically, but up the top here, we can see um, we can see two fatty, you know, see two lipid molecules, this one here and this one here. And we can notice there's a difference in the structure. Okay. At the top is what we call a saturated carbon, a saturated carbon skeleton, which makes up a saturated fat. It just shows you that all of the potential um, carbon atoms here, 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 here are occupied with hydrogen atoms here, 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 etc. Whereas on this one, there's still room, there's still potentially room for more. Okay. Now, when this happens, we see double bonds being made. Okay. So we see another bond made between these two carbons. Okay. So whereas up here, we've got this sort of single bond here, we can see a double bond. Now, why is that important? Well, all that you need to understand at this moment in time is that saturated fats promote the production of high levels of cholesterol in the body. That's all I'm going to say on that, that chemical um, process. But what we do need to know about lipids is that it isn't as simple as we can't have saturated fats we must have unsaturated fats because all lipids are important and it's a question of balance. It's a question of whether um, our bodies require saturated fat. They might require saturated fats in some circumstances. So we must have some sort of balance in understanding um, the need for the different types of fats in our diet. So those are the three major macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins and lipids 
Another thing that we measure in our diet, and I'm briefly going to cover it now, is energy content. And the reason I'm covering that is because when you go and buy your food in the supermarket, or you research online what the nutrient qualities of your food are, one of the things that you're, you're looking at are calories, which is a measure of energy content. Now, how much energy does the body require? Well, the energy required by our bodies is actually dependent on two things. First of all, our basal metabolic rate. That may differ between all of us. So we might have lower or higher basal metabolic rates, and it's probably due to activity, um, I mean fitness, and as well as some genetics. The other thing that we need to consider alongside this basal metabolic rate is our physical activity level. Because obviously the more active we are, some, a higher physical activity level will raise our metabolic rate. And I'm sure we all intuitively know that, that if we exercise, we need more um, nutrients and oxygen and raw materials. So our body raises the amount of chemical reactions to generate those. So a base of metabolic rate can be measured, and it's the overall energy utilization when the body is at rest. Okay? Not just after a meal, not just after a marathon or, or, or physical exertion, at a calm time during the day. Um, and it is measured, and this uh, lady up here has a mask on, you can see. And what they're doing is they're measuring her carbon dioxide um, output. Because her carbon dioxide output and her oxygen input are correlated with metabolism. Because we need oxygen so much to drive energy producing reactions, and because carbon dioxide is produced by energy producing reactions, we can measure the amounts of these gases and calculate the metabolic rate of that person. Then if we add to that the physical activity level of that person, then we can work out how much energy they will require. So somebody who does a lot of physical activity um, with a normal basal metabolic rate is going to need more energy than somebody with a normal basal metabolic rate and a low physical activity level. Now we all know that if you look at the um, sides of your food, they give some recommendations. They give some recommendations in terms of calories or in joules. So energy is measured in calories. But actually, we're not measuring pure calories, we're measuring something called kilocalories, or thousands of calories. Now the measure of a calorie is a measure of heat generation. So when it says um, a number of calories of a food, it's how much heat is generated when that food is broken down. Okay. So when we break down food, we release energy. The energy is transferred as heat, and that heat can be measured, and therefore we can measure um, calories by measuring heat transfer. And we can do it in laboratories. We have sensitive equipment that can analyze food stuff for energy production. Now, a kilocalorie um, is an older measure of, of energy, a more modern measure is joules okay and you will see on the sides of your food packets both kilocalories and joules kcal and kj and there is the conversion so basically calories are a measure of the amount of energy that is present in a particular foodstuff So moving on now, another component, a rather sort of indefinable component for most people, is something called fibre. Now fibre 
is the name given to undigestible, indigestible complex carbohydrates. And it includes a number of different types of um, complex carbohydrates. Things like cellulose, hemicellulose, pectin, and various sorts of gums of vegetable origin. Now these molecules are not broken down fully in the human gut. We do not have all of the right bacteria to do this. Other animals, herbivores, things like cows and sheep, etc., they do. They have a special digestive system which can break down these substances and release their energy. We as humans can't do that. Some of the fiber that we eat is actually soluble. So it goes into solution. And when it gets to the lower gut, when it gets down to our lower intestines, it actually can be broken down partially by the bacteria that live there. And this is the reason why high fiber diets can actually increase the amount of gas that you produce. Because the bacteria in our guts can actually ferment these and produce um, carbon dioxide um, gas and methane, which is, um, which is effectively the cause of flatulence. Now fiber, much discussion has been made about fiber, and I'm sure that you realize that most of the dietary um, recommendations would, um, would suggest that we eat lots of fiber, including fruit and vegetables, our five portions a day. Now, why is fiber important? What benefits can we possibly have by having this indigestible substance in our body? Well, first of all, Possible fiber benefits include the ability for the substances to absorb water. And as they absorb water, they make fecal matter easier to pass through the intestine. So they cause, cause less damage, and they cause less trauma to the digestive system. Now, because fiber also bulks up our feces, because it also bulks up, our feces in our bowels, it also promotes peristaltic movement. So it sort of pushes against the edge of the bowel and causes the body to press against this and push the um, fecal matter quicker through the, the bowel itself. So one of the um, things that this does is it means any toxic components in our feces in our undigested food, does not spend a lot of time hanging around in our bowel. And that is a reason why fiber is, is thought to be important, because it promotes regular movement of feces through our intestine. And the other thing is that fiber bulks out our feces, and it interferes with the absorption of some substances. So because you've got a bulked out, undigestible, um, substance in your feces, there is less chance that substances that are harmful to the body, such as things like um, cholesterol and other maybe harmful lipids, are not absorbed because they're tied up in the bulk of the fecal matter. But again, fibre is one of those issues that we will always continue to come back about until we're absolutely sure about its benefits and exactly how much is needed, and exactly what it act and what it does. We can associate it with good health, but we don't really know why. Okay, so we're all aware that we should make healthy choices in how we eat, and one of the reasons we make healthy choices in the way we eat, is to get vitamins. We've known for a couple of hundred years now, or even longer, that certain foods keep us healthy, and the absence of certain foods in our diet make us suffer from 
vitamin deficiencies. So let's have a look at what vitamins are. Vitamins are part of what we call the group of micronutrients. They're only needed in relatively small amounts, although they're needed regularly. So we need vitamins, these, these substances, for a number of important things. First of all, we need these vitamins because they help us work. They help the enzyme activity in our cells. The other thing as well is that we know that they act as important um, cofactors in signaling in the body. So we need them um, to carry out important body functions. To date, we've identified 13 different vitamins. And we can classify them into two groups. Simplistically, based on whether they dissolve in water or whether they dissolve in fat. Now there's an easy way to remember which one is which because there are four fat soluble vitamins A, D, E and K. A, D, E and K. So if you remember that then you will understand that the other vitamins um, are water soluble. We all know about vitamin deficiencies. So for instance we know that traditionally scurvy, that scourge of the Royal Navy when people were on ships for a long time without fresh fruit and vegetable and their teeth started to fall out and their wounds wouldn't heal. So we know about scurvy. And we also know about rickets, people with bow legs, people with skeletal problems, which is a vitamin D deficiency. D and C. And there's a whole range of different types of vitamin deficiencies. The other thing about vitamins is because they're normally required at small amounts, sometimes if we take too many, we can cause damage to the heart. and we could cause damage to other organs like the liver. So let's have a look at that. So vitamin A, vitamin A is a fat soluble um, vit vitamin and we know from eating diets with high amounts of vitamin A it causes liver damages. And one of the cases where this was particularly obvious is in early explorers who explored the Arctic and Antarctic regions. They found animals. They found animals that ate a huge amount of um, lipid-containing food, um, like fish, and their livers were absolutely packed with um, vitamin A. And they became ill after eating um, this type of food because of the huge amount of vitamin A present. Vitamin D, on the other hand, causes calcium deposition. So too much vitamin D in our diets or too much vitamin E produced in, in the body can cause the deposition of calcium in our tissues, which can affect the proper functioning of nerves and the heart muscle. Now vitamins are a mystery. Um, we basically discovered them by understanding that their absence caused health problems. We still don't know completely how they work in the body, but we do know that the best way of describing them is that they are what we call cofactors in biochemical reactions. So important chemical reactions in the body. So for instance, vitamin K here, one of the fat soluble vitamins, is very, very important in blood clotting. Okay. In the food that we eat, we also ingest minerals. Minerals that the animal gained from its diet, or minerals that the plant gained from its soil that it lives in. And we've known for a long time that minerals are important. Minerals 
play a very, very important part in biochemical and physiological processes. And there's a huge number of them. You've only got to go to Boots and buy a mineral or vitamin supplement to realize there's a great big long list of things that you don't, you didn't even understand that exist. So there's things like iron and zinc and calcium and sodium and chloride and phosphorus and potassium and magnesium and manganese and selenium and cobalt and iodine and chromium and aluminium and boron, etc., etc., etc. There seems to be an endless list of these different elements, these different minerals. We know they're important because they form the fluids of our body. We find them taking part in chemical reactions in our body. But we still don't know the complete list of uh, important substances um, with regard to minerals. So every now and then we discover uh, a mineral that seems to be important for key processes in the body. And then there's a bit of a fad about it and people will... Um, decide that they need to have mineral supplementation. And that's happened in the past with things like um, um, selenium, for instance, yeah, and, um, and calcium. So we often now, again, you'll turn up in boots and one month you'll see blackcurrant flavored calcium uh, supplements. Then we'll see some strawberry flavored selenium supplements, or you'll see multivitamins with extra selenium. And this changes due to fads that happen when people find new functions for some of these minerals. One of the characteristics of all life is DNA. And DNA is a nucleic acid. And DNA and RNA are important in the generation and control of all living organisms. So effectively, nucleic acids are at the heart of everything that goes on in our bodies. So we need to be able to make nucleic acids, repair nucleic acids, replenish nucleic acids on a day-to-day -day basis. Now we make them out of a group of different molecules, sugars, and what we call the, the purine and pyrimidine bases, as well as um, phosphate ions. We largely get our raw materials from that, um, from the fact that we eat living organisms. So whether that be an animal or a plant, we're eating substances that contain DNA and RNA. And we recycle them by breaking them down and rebuilding them in our own body. It's an overlooked part of our diet, but nucleic acids are in every living thing. So as long as we're eating living things, we have a ready source of those different nucleic acids. Okay, finally, very, very important component of our diets, water. 60% or more of our body is composed of water. Water is required to be distributed in a precise and regulated manner. If we don't balance our fluids in our body, then all sorts of things happen to us. Water is key to all of our metabolism because the chemical reactions go on in an aqueous solution. The vast majority of all the chemicals that go into the body dissolve into water. And we have to keep replenishing water because we lose it regularly through urine, feces, through our breath, in water vapor, and through sweating. So we have to take in water in our diet to replenish those stores. Okay, so what we've looked at so far is the concept of a diet a diet containing various components, and why those components are important, what they do, and where they're found in our diet. The next stage of our journey is to understand the process of how we acquire all of these individual nutrients in uh, our diet, how we use them, 
how we extract them. So nutrients are obtained in the food we eat in a group of processes we call digestion. Now, it may sound, it may sound strange or it may look strange that I seem to have um, two slides up the top here that appear to be showing you mining and mineral extraction. Well, basically, the whole process of mining, of gathering the, the raw material, and then breaking it down into, into the, uh, in the case of this is platinum extraction, and breaking it down to extract um, key substances, is exactly the same as what goes on in our body when we eat. We basically take in the raw materials, and then we go through a series of processes of digestion. And all these processes are formed, so all these processes are performed by the various organs, tissues and cells of our digestive system. So we're going to see the digestive system um, in a minute. And when we see it, we should remember, however complex it is, however large it seems, it really has one key function to disassemble efficiently food molecules to provide a source of nutrient molecules for our body's homeostasis to provide the individual nutrient molecules that our cells require to keep our bodies functioning normally so here is the human digestive system the human digestive system is as i said not an assembly line, a disassembly line. And as food passes through it, it becomes less complex at each stage. Now digestion is composed of six essential activities and the human digestive system facilitates those six activities. Ingestion taking in the food into the body, propulsion, moving it through the digestive tract, mechanical, mechanical digestion, physically breaking down food into smaller parts, chemical digestion, using a range of different chemical substances to break down our food, absorption and assimilation, the taking in of food molecules into the body, and putting them into the places that they uh, are required. And finally, defecation, the removal of undigested waste matter from the body. So all of this complexity in here, all of the complexity that we're going to see in the digestive system is there to provide these six essential activities. But before we start, what is it that drives our wish to eat? What is it that drives us to put food into our mouth? The key thing to say is that food intake is strongly regulated by our central nervous system. And when we look at the brain, We've been able to identify hunger centers and satiety centers. Satiety meaning fullness or adequacy. So we found parts of the brain that are heavily active when we're hungry, and we found parts of the brain that are heavily active when we're full. Now, a number of theories um, have been uh, put forward to how hunger is driven. Two key ones are blood glucose levels and other body temperature. So these theories say that when blood glucose reaches a certain level in the body, then the hunger center is stimulated and that brings on thoughts of food and food intake. Other people say it changes, minute changes in body temperature as a result of decreased metabolic activity. So when we're running out of food, we somehow slow down in terms of the chemical reactions in our body, and that has a, a body temperature um, trigger. So 
satiety or fullness is something that we do know is actually controlled by stretch receptors in our digestive system. And we know this because of um, experiments that have been done, things like the gastric bands and gastric balloons, whereby inflating, um, either inflating the stomach or stretching the stomach or reducing the size of the stomach so that smaller amounts of food stretch it um, causes us to believe that we're full and not to eat anymore. But I think the key thing to say is that one of the things about humans and food is there are a huge amount of psychological factors in play. Okay, we have basic instincts, and we have basic um, we have basic uh, control measures, but those can be overridden by a range of psychological factors. And I think it's because food, like anything else, like fear, um, attraction, stimuli like that, can condition us, that we can become conditioned to food. So we might eat when we're not hungry because it gives us some sort of psychological benefit. And that can override more subtle um, physiological control mechanisms like the hunger and satiety centers. We, we actually physically override them. Okay, so where does food go first of all? Okay, so food normally enters through the mouth and is chewed by using your teeth and your tongue. We then, as we're chewing, adds more and more saliva um, to lubricate this and to aid in the disassembly of the food, um, of the food particles. In the mouth, with the addition of saliva, we produce what is called a bolus for swallowing. The saliva we produce is largely water, but it also contains other things, such as some basic enzymes like salivary amylase, um, and some mucus, and also some parts of our defense system like lysozyme and immunoglobulin A produced to try and neutralize any bacteria or any foreign bodies that might have come in with the food. So it's a, a protective um, component of saliva. Now when we've swallowed, effectively um, the bolus uh, passes down the esophagus and it is squeezed by the muscular esophagus down towards the stomach. So here's a picture of the stomach. You can see it's roughly a J shape. It's very muscular and it's 15 to 25 centimeters long. So that's not particularly big in its sort of relaxed state, but it can accommodate a whole range of different volumes. So actually the smallest amount of um, content of a stomach can be as little as 50 milliliters and the largest amount um, can be up to four liters. Now the stomach can expand to a large extent and descend quite low into the abdominal cavity. However, when it's empty, it collapses. And the reason it can collapse is because of the folding on the um, inside. So it reduces to folds um, called rugae, and you can see them here. You can see these folds in the stomach, okay? There's a number of different regions to the stomach, and we can look at those, if you like, in um, order. The first part of the stomach that food will come into from the esophagus is the cardia, the cardiac region. And the next portion is something that we call the fundus, which is the dome-shaped um, part of the stomach here. The next part is the body of the stomach, where bulk of the activity occurs. 
And the final part is the pyloric region. The pyloric region um, consisting of um, different components, but largely the last part of the um, stomach before food will then pass into the intestine, which starts here. Okay. Now, the stomach does a large amount of digestion. And to understand it, we need to understand how it does this. So in terms of mechanical and chemical digestion. And also, we need to know in some detail how it's controlled. Because digestion in the stomach needs to be controlled to ensure that the food that reaches the intestine is in the proper form for digestion. So let's have a look first of all at the secretions of the stomach. So we can identify a number of different secretions from the lining of the stomach. First of all, we notice mucus. A mucus is a characteristic secretion all the way down our digestive system. In the stomach, it's quite alkaline. The reason being is that alkaline nature protects the lining of the stomach against the acid that is um, in the stomach gastric juice. Now glands at the top part of the um, stomach in that fundus region, the dome shaped region I showed you earlier, produce the majority of our gastric juice. And the gastric juice when analyzed can be shown to contain a number of different things. First of all, hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid, strong acid to break down and hydrolyze foods, break chemical bonds, um, a chemical digestion. We also find some interesting um, little digestive factors, one of these called intrinsic factor, uh, its full name intrinsic factor of uh, castle. This is secreted here and then later on in the intestine is important for the absorption of vitamin B12. So vitamin B12 must be an important enzyme to humans if we produce this special transport molecule here in the stomach. We also produce enzymes. And the enzymes are usually formed in what we call precursor forms. So they're actually released as inactive enzymes and when they contact the acid of the stomach, they then um, are activated. So pepsinogen is the precursor, and it becomes the enzyme pepsin. The other thing that we note about the stomach is it secretes an awful lot of signaling molecules, and we'll see those in a minute. But they're needed to regulate the secretions of the stomach and the digestive process. Okay, so the stomach is very important. It churns our food and mechanically digests it. It also produces a large amount of chemicals for chemical digestion. So how is it controlled? How does the body control these activities as food passes into the body and through the stomach towards the intestine. Effectively, gastric function is controlled by both hormones and nerves. And we can identify three phases of gastric secretion. So three phases of the secretion of gastric juices in the stomach. And those are the cephalic, the gastric, and intestinal phases. Okay. Now these are all phases going on in the stomach, although their control may come from other parts of the body. 
they're not separate because you can potentially find all three phases going on at any one time. Let's have a look at those three phases. Cephalic, gastric, and intestinal phases. This is the initial phase of gastric control. It's a short phase, about a few minutes long, and this is, is basically triggered by taste, aroma, sight of food, the thought of food. So this is a sort of emotional, physiological trigger. And it's because there are a whole range of inputs um, from sensory organs, sight and smell, and maybe taste, uh, of the food, which is inputted into the hypothalamus and the brain, basically leading to nerve impulses down towards the stomach. What's interesting about the cephalic phase is that it's con a conditioned reflex. So it accounts for the fact that some of us might salivate at the very thought of broccoli, whilst others want a big cream cake because we're psychologically conditioned to the food um, that we like or even that we want. And there are some theories that the body knows what it wants and uh, we can use that to direct what we need to eat. But because this is a conditioned reflex, it's very likely that most of us um, don't act on those normal um, responses that we've conditioned our own, usually through our own experience, through a psychological conditioning, through our upbringing. We also know that this reflex can be suppressed. So for instance, depressed people can suppress this. So depressed people can tend to eat less. Okay. Um, we also know uh, we can, uh, in elderly people, we can lose appetite and it's thought that because it's part of this process um, it's conditioned out of them that they no longer um, respond to taste so well or smell so well and therefore they lose this reflex but it's the initial phase of gastric secretion and it starts off the journey of the food through our gut because the stomach starts to secrete gastric juice in anticipation of a meal. Now once food has entered the stomach, we now see what we call the gastric phase of control. And the gastric phase is in response to stretch receptors being stretched by um, food entering the stomach. So as food enters the stomach, you get this neural reflex which then um, results in gastric juice um, secretion. The most important mechanism for this is the release of the hormone gastrin. Okay. So in addition to stretching, when we get certain um, substances in our diet exposed to the wall of our stomach, so things of a certain acidity or alkalinity, certain proteins and substances like caffeine, they can stimulate the production of um, gastrin. And gastrin is then responsible for the secretion of gastric juices. What we do know, however, is that we can control the level of gastric juice secretion by using a number of different stimuli in combination. And the three important um, stimulants are acetylcholine, which is a nerve transmitter uh, um, from the nervous system, gastrin, so gastrin um, we've seen produced uh, in the lining, and histamine, histamine um, produced in the cells and tissues uh, of the stomach. Now what's interesting in is that we only have one of these present, then we get this small um, trickle of gastric juice. But if we have all three of them together, acetylcholine, gastrin, and histamine, 
literally the juice pours from the lining of the cell. It can literally squirt out so strong that it squirts into the stomach. And one of the ways that we can control um, gastric acid secretion is to use drugs that stimulate, um, that, that sort of use drugs that inhibit the, these components. So a number of different um, drugs have been um, introduced to reduce gastric acid secretion or too much gastric acid secretion that might cause damage um, to our stomachs. So finally, the intestinal phase. So basically, the intestinal phase um, is an excitatory reaction or an excitation initiated when food enters the first part of the small intestine. When food enters the first part of the small intestine, cells in the wall of the intestine secrete hormones. It's a brief phase as the intestine fills with the stomach contents. However, if the food is not, if the food is not fully digested and there's too much acid in it, then we can actually have an inhibitory portion to this reflex. That's basically um, where the body inhibits local activity and tightens up the connection between the stomach and the intestine called the pyloric sphincter. So this is a self-regulating, um, this is a self regulating uh, control on the stomach by the intestine. So it's basically designed to ensure that any food entering your intestine is properly digested. We've identified a number of different hormones involved in that, secretin being one of the major ones. The other ones I've just abbreviated. You don't need to know the full names, um, but in fact, this one is called cholecystokinin pancreasimin. This is vasoactive intestinal peptide. And this is, um, I, I can't remember this one, let's call it GIP. Okay, so that's the stomach. So we've effectively, up till now, had a journey into here. So our journey up to now has been to this point. Where we need to go next is into this next region, which is the intestinal region. But before we get there, we must note that there are some important organs also in this region that need to be discussed. They're placed in this area because they provide important factors that aid digestion and also produce important signals to control the metabolism of the body. So let's have a look at those now. And the first organ I want to look at is the pancreas. Now the pancreas is sort of leaf shape or what we tend to call a triangular oblong. And it sits here the loop in the loop of the duodenum, the stomach is up here. It produces pancreatic juice, and pancreatic juice is delivered into the duodenum via pancreatic ducts. And effectively, substances are produced in the pancreas into the pancreatic duct and then secreted into the um, duodenum. So the cells, and we'll see them in a minute, are called, secretory cells are called acini and they're clustered around the ducts of the pancreas. Now scattered amongst the acini are what we call the islet cells. Islet cells are important 
because they produce the two key hormones. And we saw these in our endocrine system lecture, insulin and glucagon. So here's a diagram showing you that structure. So here's another picture of the pancreas. You can see it's been opened up to see this central duct that goes into the duodenum. And if we look here, we can see um, these pancreatic acini, and there's the entrance to a duct. In between them, these little islands or islets of cells. And there are two different types of islet cell. You know, because we spoke about them earlier, so there's the alpha cell, which is responsible for glucagon. And then there's the beta cell responsible for insulin. Okay. Pancreatic juice is very important for digestion. And we produce up to one and a half liters of pancreatic juice daily. It consists of water, enzymes, and electrolytes. It's produced in the acena cells and the epithelial cells in the pancreas release bicarbonate to raise its alkalinity. Now this alkalinity is there to neutralize acid from gastric secretion. And raising this um, pH is important to trigger enzyme activity. Because just like in the stomach, pancreatic enzymes are produced in an inactive form and then activated when they get into the digestive tract. And here, the um, activation pH is higher than in the, in the stomach. Okay. So, a whole range of different enzymes for proteins and sugars. So for proteins, proteases, um, amylases for sugars, lipases for fats, and nucleases for nucleic acids. These are all secreted by in the pancreatic juice. Now pancreatic secretion is regulated in a number of ways and it's shown on this diagram. So we can secrete um, pancreatic secretions um, basically uh, through the presence of acid and through the presence of fat um, in our diet. We also can do it via the nervous system. So we can get pancreatic secretion by stimulation from the vagus nerve. One of the key important um, controls, however, is secreting, hormone secreting and CCK, which we talked about earlier. So secreting um, basically responds to the presence of hydrochloric acid from gastric juice, and that targets the high alkaline bicarbonate-rich pancreatic juice from the duct cells, whereas CCK is basically um, uh, produced as a response to fats and proteins, and that stimulates the enzyme-rich pancreatic juice. The nerve stimulation is really um, occurs during what we call those cephalic and gastric phases of gastric secretion that we spoke about earlier. Okay. Now the other structure, and I'll show it in context, here is the gallbladder. And the gallbladder plays an important accessory role also in um, digestion. Here it is on the underside of the liver. 
The gallbladder secretes bile, which is a yellowish green alkaline solution containing a number of different substances, bile salts, and pigments, cholesterol, um, fats, um, phospholipids, and electrolytes. The bile salts are important because they aid fat digestion. They emulsify the fat droplets, making a bigger surface area so that they can be digested in the intestine. Now bile pigments, which give it its color, um, are things such as bilirubin. Bilirubin is a waste product of red cell um, destruction, so of a breakdown of the pigment in red blood cells. One of the breakdown products of bilirubin is something called urobilinogen. And it is urobilinogen in its early yellow form that gives color to urine and in its oxidized brown form the color to feces. So the gallbladder produces these substances which then pass into the bile duct and if we look at previous we look at the previous slide here we can see that the bile duct also comes here alongside the pancreatic um, duct here um, into the duodenum. So both in this loop of the duodenum we have secretions from both the pancreas and from the bile duct. Okay. Right. So this region, the organs of this region have been now covered. And we've started to look at this part, the duodenum, because this is where these organs enter into. However, our next phase is to look at the small intestine this long convoluted tube. We're going to find out that the small intestine is composed of two primary parts, jejunum and the ileum. So, the small intestine extends from the pyloric sphincter here, the end of the stomach, all the way down to here, to the ileocecal valve, where um, it then enters the large intestine. The first part we've already spoken about, so the shortest part is the duodenum, which is this loop. The next part is the jejunum. The jejunum is the first part of the small intestine and it is responsible for digestion. It's the major digestive area uh, of the small intestine. It's about two and a half meters in length. The next part of the small intestine is the ileum. And the ileum is the main area of nutrient absorption. So the jejunum is digestive and the ileum is absorptive. So that's the small intestine. So let's have a look first of all at the processes of digestion. Basically, this diagram shows you how digestion occurs mechanically in the small intestine. And it's all to do with the contraction of smooth muscle around the walls of the intestine. As they squeeze, they um, mechanically digest the food in this process called segmentation. And effectively, by contracting independently, these different parts of the intestine push um, the food backwards and forwards on a steady um, forward movement down the intestine. And what that does is it breaks up the food into um, smaller and smaller parts. So it's a movement and a squashing or squishing of your food in this muscular tube that breaks it down um, into smaller parts mechanically. But the other thing that it does 
is that it mixes the food with the digestive enzymes. So effectively mixes it with all the digestive enzymes that have come from the pancreas, the proteases, the lipases, the amylases, etc., and allows them to start to, to break down individual um, food molecules to liberate nutrient molecules um, for absorption. So this segmentation is moving um, backwards and forwards and it's actually uh, induced by pacemaker activity in the smooth muscle itself. So the muscle independently starts to contract and this drives this process of food moving backwards and forwards being squished but gently moving overall in a forward motion through the small intestine. So that's the digestive processes. Let's have a look at the absorptive processes. As I said, the major area of absorption in the intestine is the ileum. And if you look at a cross-section of the ileum, you'll notice that it's very, very highly folded and it produces millions and millions of little projections um, called villi. And looking at the tissue of the small intestine, this gives the tissue a velvety texture with these millions and millions of little finger-like um, projections. When we look at a, a villus over here, so this is a diagram of a villus, we can see that it has a fixed structure. So around the outside, it has a, the absorptive cells. So it has cells that absorb the various nutrients. Some of them, um, some of the nutrients needing to be broken down in those cells. But then the absorbed nutrients go in to blood vessels in the core of the villus. The other thing that we need to know is the cells of the outside themselves have tiny projections too. And they're called microvilli or a brush border. We'll see this all better on our next slide. So this picture here is an electron micrograph of the lining of the intestine. And you can see these very defined finger-like projections sticking out into the intestine itself. Now if we take a section through this, so for instance if we were to slice this down the middle here and take a section through this, we'd see something like this here. So on the outside we'd see loads and loads of cells. You can see them all lined up here in columns. And these are the cells that absorb the nutrients. And in the middle, this is the central space where we find the blood vessels and a space called the lacteal, which is part of the lymphatic system. Now this picture is very, very high magnification of just one of these cells, just one of these cells. And on the outer border here, you'll note thousands and thousands of tiny microvilli, okay? So we call those microvilli. By having all of these projections, and each of those having thousands and thousands and millions of their own projections, basically what we do is we increase the surface area for absorption. Okay, we increase the surface area for absorption to a vast um, area so that it's relatively easy to absorb the nutrients that are passing through our gut. Now, carbohydrates enter into the um, system of the body through epithelial cells. 
And we can see this diagram here shows you how things like glucose, a monosaccharide, is taken across the cells of the villus into the blood. So there are specific carrier molecules that take these sugars in. Now, disaccharides or sugars with more than one um, portion to them need to be broken down before they can be transported. And this happens up here in the brush brush border. So there are, there are enzymes up here which break down sugars like lactose. And this is the site of lactose intolerance. So people who can't take dairy products who are lactose intolerant don't have the enzymes in this region here to break down the lactose into smaller sugars. And what happens is, is that lactose stays out here in the gut and gets fermented by bacteria and causes lactic acid production, irritation and gas production. So lactose intolerance is solely due to the lack of enzymes in this brush border. Proteins are carried across, um, proteins are broken down and carried across in the form of amino acids. So proteins are broken up by proteases. So those enzymes called proteases that you find in the stomach and in the intestine chop up proteins into their amino acids. We saw that earlier, that proteins are made up of combinations of amino acids. Now basically, we break these down um, uh, from small chains of two and three peptides, okay, and these are broken down in the cells of the gut, cells of the villi, and then they enter the blood via diffusion, okay. So first of all, individual amino acids that have been broken down will easily pass through to the blood through the cells. Small peptides need to be broken down into single peptides um, and then amino acids inside the cell. Large peptides don't enter um, and stay outside and they need to be broken down further before they um, get in. We do know, however, that some large protein molecules can get through by a process called endocytosis, where the cell engulfs um, the protein. So let me draw a cell. So let me draw one of those cell here. There we go. There's a cell with a nucleus. Okay. So cells can change their membrane to engulf the protein. Sorry, forgot me nuclei. One, two, three. So the protein is engulfed by the cell, enters the cell, and then it's broken down inside the cell to its component parts. Now the next process, set of processes are a bit more complex. And that's because fats are fats and they don't dissolve in water. So moving them around the body requires them to be carried in a number of different ways. Basically, when we break down lipids, we make free fatty acids and monoglycerides. Because if you remember, we talked about triglycerides earlier, saying that they were the main dietary fat. Now, effectively, to be able to carry them around, um, or to be able to carry them around and digest them, first of all, they get associated with substances like bile salts and another um, substance called lecithin to form structures called micelles. 
Now my cells touch up to the um, epithelial and the lipid soluble substance is passed directly into the cell itself. Now inside the cell, basically these free fatty acids are resynthesized into a, a delivery package, which is triglycerides with phospholipids and cholesterol and a skin of protein. And these become chylomicrons. Now a few of the individual fatty acids may enter the blood directly, but the bulk of fats that you actually um, absorb are basically absorbed into the lymphatic system via these structures called chylomicrons. When the chylomicrons get into the blood, enzymes in the blood break them open to release their packages of fatty acids and glycerols. Let's see that on the next slide. So here we are. Here's the, in here's the inside of the gut and here what I'm drawing here is the mishmash of food, digestive food. And some of that is partially digestive fat in the form of those micelles. Now those micelles pass into the cell and then they're made in to these packages called um, chylomicrons. And the chylomicrons are then released, so this is the chylomicron, into the lymph. Okay, so this is um, the package mechanism to ensure that fat is distributed around the body. So it keeps fat in little packages that can be then transferred around the body. Okay, so we're nearing the end of our journey now. So we enter the end of the ilium here, and this is something called the ileocecal valve around here. So the next part of our, and the final part of our journey is here in the large intestine. So here on this diagram is the large intestine. And the major parts that we have are the cecum and the appendix, the colon, ascending colon, transverse colon, and descending colon, and then finally we have the rectum and anal canal. We can see on this diagram here, it's also a magnified area of the um, lining of the uh, intestinal mucosa. So what are the functions of the large intestine? First of all, it's a site of storage of our undigested food before we defecate. It's also important to secrete mucus that lubricates the passage of feces and also regulates the pH. It's also a site of absorption for water, remaining electrolytes, sodium, calcium, potassium, etc., and vitamins. And some of these vitamins are actually made in the large intestine by bacteria. It's a big site of bacterial activity and many millions and millions and millions of bacteria generating this undigested food. And the last role of this intestine is to consolidate and compact the feces. So to pack it down, remove a lot of its water, and to put it into little packages ready to defecation. So the process of defecation is the last of the six processes of digestion. It's, it's a reflex reaction. The first part is that the accumulation of fecal matter 
stimulate sensory receptors. And just like in your bladder, the rectum and anus, there are two sphincters, an internal and an external sphincter. And they're controlled by both involuntary and voluntary nervous activity. So the first part of defecation is the stimulation of the opening of the inner sphincter, and this is involuntary. The second part is voluntary. And that is what we learn when we do potty training. We learn the appropriate time to open that external sphincter. So that is a voluntary reaction. It's conditioned and learned. The other thing that aids defecation is something called the gastrocolonic reflex. You've probably noticed that if you've recently had a meal, for instance, such as your breakfast, you often then have the need to go to the loo. And this is caused by a wave of contraction that passes down the intestines, and it's called the gastrocolonic reflex. And this wave of contraction is there to push out um, the undigested, stored fecal matter in the process of defecation. So, we finish now the processes of human digestion. So we've looked at the structure, the function, and the control of the human digestive system. With all its complexity, remember it has one simple function, to break down food materials into simple nutrients to be absorbed into the body to supply all the billions of cells with the raw material and the energy they need to survive, thrive, grow, and develop. So this is the end of this lecture and the end of the lecture series from me. I hope you've enjoyed them, and I'm sure that these video recordings will soon be placed on YouTube for you to enjoy again if you need to. So goodbye.